So we're recording, and for the benefit of those who are watching this recording, this is session two of our DITA TC GitHub um, training. And we are, uh, t today's purpose is for Chris to walk Maria through uh, all the steps of uh, what we're going to, what, what, a, what a typical one of us is going to need to do with GitHub, um, all the way from, I think, account sign up through uh, doing pull requests. So, uh, right now, Maria is presenting her screen, and uh, Chris and Maria, take it away. Okay. Right. Well, Maria, I can see you're at the right place. And from here, you want to go ahead and click the link that says sign up. Okay. I did that. I've already done that. And um, Okay. So you have created a personal account. I I thought I had because when I put in, well, let's try it. Um, you know, this is the, so, you know, so, right now so you're, you're at a page where you would be creating an account. If you already have one, there's a separate link where you would sign in. Right. So it says my username is already taken and my okay. message 429 and that's got to be me. So, okay. so, so I assume I already have one. Um, Let's go ahead then, and instead of trying to sign up and join GitHub, if you yeah. will go up to the link that says sign in. All right. Okay. So let's put in that. And that, so, and I didn't remember my password, so I've done, I did this before, and it said it was sending information here. To your email address. So it really can't, it says it can't find that email. Okay, well, let's, why don't we have you create another user account? Okay, all right, sounds good. And you. Okay, so. If I just do message, that's already taken. All right. Okay. Okay. And you're fine for having a free account. There's no need for you to get a developer account. Okay. All right. Should I go start a project? Nope. This is the okay. point where you're you are now logged into you should be logged into GitHub. And what you want to do is create a fork of the particular DITA TC repository you'll be working on. Okay. And I think in your case, that would be the DITA TechCom repository. Okay. So if you can go to that link. All right. So... And I had that up before. Um, if you happen to have the PDF open from the education session we did last week, oh. you'll, that'll have the that link in it. Yeah, I don't have that open. Um, all right, let me find it. Is there someone who could just quickly get that URL and paste it in chat for Maria? I'm looking at chat. No one's done it. I can, I can, I've got it saved in here. Oh, okay. Got it. Thanks, Tom. You bet.
So you beat me to it. <laughs> now, okay, so this is the official repository for the um, DITA for Technical Communication Subcommittee. And what you want to do here, Maria, is you're going to fork this repository. Okay. And forking is the Git term for you're going to make a copy of this. And to do that, there, there's a button at the upper right corner of the page that says fork. And if you click that. Okay, it wants me to verify my email. Let's look at that. Okay. Okay, so. So I've verified my email. And maybe you just try uh, going back a page back. and trying to click fork again. All right. Okay. All right. Now you want to bookmark this URL. Because okay. you're going to need it later as you set up source tree. Okay. And you can see this is your 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 fork of the Data for Techcom repository. Okay. And it, you know, the URL tells you that. Um, also at the top of the page, it'll say, you know, this is Maria's fork of Data Techcom, and it'll tell you where it was originally forked from, which is okay. the main repository. All right. It is bookmarked. So yay. Um, you have, you know, you, you've gotten a, a GitHub ID and you have forked the TC repository. And the next thing is to set up source tree so that you can perform work from inside it. Okay. And I'm assuming at this point you have installed source tree. I have. Okay, awesome. So let's go ahead and open up source tree. Okay. Where did it go? Oh, there we go. It's still opening. Okay. And the first thing you're going to do within source tree is you are going to clone the repository, your forked repository to your local system. Okay. And to do that, you're going to want to click file clone new. Okay. okay. And in that um, first field, you want to paste the URL of your fork. Okay. Okay. And in the second field, you want to, you know, uh, give a destination path for where on your local system you want to have this content. And where do most people put it? Like, do they just stick it on their desktop or? Um, I, I don't know about most people. Um, I have personally, and we can get feedback from everybody on the call. I've done two, you know, one of two things. I've either had like a, you know, a Git directory at the root of my C drive, and then I have a whole lot of repos under that, or, um, I have done repos in, you know, particular client specific locations. I would not use your desktop. Desktop okay. in, in Windows is generally not a good thing. Okay. I would suggest to just, you know, do, you might want to have, and you can, you can just specify it. You don't have to create a directory in File Explorer. You can specify it from within source tree. Why don't we just say from within source tree okay. that you're going to have a, uh, a C uh, Git directory. So, Okay. 
So I see so users instead of, MSIG. instead of users, you know, MSIG documents, why don't you just substitute a directory called git and leave the ditta.com. And add the data tech com to it. Um, let's just, let's just yeah try to just do let's see what happens if you just type c um, c git and get rid of the users and ethic. Okay. Okay. That's gonna clone that repo into that directory, which you probably don't want. You probably want git slash data tech com. Yeah. Okay. The other, the other uh, forward slash, yeah, okay, like that, or the other slash, the other one, because yeah. you're on a Windows system. Okay. You you might want to match the the name of the repo, which is lowercase oh. data. Okay. And they, yeah. Shouldn't matter. Now, um, both should be valid, just, but yeah. In the file, the, the, the uh, field directly under the one you're in typing in, uh -huh. this is where you actually, if you want to give it a name that'll be easier for you to remember, you know, you can. This is simply what the, um, within source tree, what it will show up as. Yeah. But leave it as did at com, and that's just fine too. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fine. Okay, so go ahead and click close. And what's happening now is everything that is in that repository, your forked repository, is being pulled down and put in your system. And so you're actually, you know, you're seeing a whole bunch of stuff now that would be, what are all the commits? What, are the, what is the activity that would have happened in that repository? Okay. Now, the next thing you really want to do here is you want to add the upstream repository. And by upstream repository, I mean the actual Ditacom, Ditatechcom repository that you forked from. So the way to do that, and I'm going to have to just sort of minimize your, oops, sorry. Um, you want to click the settings button and the settings button um, should be in the top right corner of source tree got it okay and so what you see here is that you've got a path to what's called origin and that is actually your fork of the repository so here go ahead and click the add button and here, you want to um, provide the information for the uh, upstream repository. So in the remote name field, I'd go ahead and type upstream. And here in the URL path field is where you want to type the URL for the actual Ditatechcom repository. So maybe you want to get that from, you know, the chat, or I think both Tom and I pasted that from for you. So is this the the this here like this, so it's this? Yep, there you go. <coughs> okay. So um, I'm a little bit confused as to what I'm doing exactly here. So. Well, I didn't. Isn't this just what I cloned and then and then placed on my C drive? Like why? Um, like well, I, I guess uh, I don't understand what the upstream is because. Well, remember that you there there is the official data techcom GitHub repository, and right. then there is your fork of it. Right. So what you cloned to your system was actually your fork. Right. Your copy. And now what we're doing is adding um, the 
original domain repository that you created your fork from and calling it upstream. So that your okay. system will know that there are two that you know that there's your fork and then there's actually the upstream repository, which I wanna, is where the official stuff is. I want to draw an analogy to, or, and and I'm, I want confirmation on this because I'm just guessing here, but I think there's an analogy directly to uh, one of Elliot's slides where he was, uh, and he's on the call now, so he, he can confirm this. Uh, where he was showing uh, the process of, of setting up and cloning your own repository and adding arrows between the different databases on the slides. And I remember after you added the, the arrows to make the copy of the database and then make your local copy, there was an arrow, another arrow that connected your local copy back to the original, and that's what this was. He even had it labeled okay. upstream, I think. Okay, I understand. So this is where when I make changes, it'll go here. It won't go to the main repository. It'll just go to this place and wait until the changes get approved. Is that yes. right? And well, okay. and, and the idea is that this is this is essentially just setting up that connection so that when you tell yeah. it you're ready to have those changes go, it knows where to go. Okay, gotcha. All right. Is that right? Or I want somebody who knows to confirm that for me. Can to be more precise, it doesn't really have to do with, you're not gonna be pushing changes directly to this repository, but when you're starting out to do work, you would be going to this upstream repository and saying, hey, I wanna create a branch, I'm ready to do some work, give me you know, the most recent up-to-date content. Okay. So, and Elliot, Robert, anybody, feel free to jump in if, you know, to to make any clarifications or corrections here. Um, that, that's yeah, really I think you've got it right. Yeah, okay. Telling so you the our other... client right here where to get the info about the latest. So the next thing for you to do here, Maria, is you want to go ahead and put your GitHub username in the username field. Um, and that was, uh, okay, that was Messig1234. I think so. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's important. You need to know the URL for the main repository, your fork of it, your GitHub user ID, and your password. Okay. So let's go ahead and click OK here. All right, so now you can see that you, you know, you're set up here, upstream is the main, you know, the, the official Oasis did a TC repository and origin is your fork. Okay. And if you find origin, you know, like a confusing name, you can change it so that it's like, it show, will show up for you as Maria's fork. Okay. But that's completely optional. I just know some people have got get confused between origin and upstream. So you're you're set up here, you can click OK. Now the next thing you need to do over here is if you go over to that, you know, one, just to orient yourself in source tree you can see that you're in the DataTechCom repository. And that's the name that shows up at the top of the tab you're in. If you have multiple repositories, you'll have multiple tabs. Okay. And right now you are on the master branch for your local working copy of all this stuff. Okay. What we, the next step we want to do here is we want to fetch from the upstream repository. Okay. And in order to do that, in that left pane, you expand remotes. And you can see here that you have both origin and upstream. And mm -hmm. origin is, again, it, that's your fork, and upstream is the Data TC repository. If you right click on upstream, you ought to be able to select fetch from upstream.
And now if you expand upstream under remote, it will show you, you know, the branches that are okay. there for the upstream repository. So you've now got that content that is from the upstream repository on your local system. Right, so this is all the most current stuff that's in there. Yep. Okay. You've got the current stuff and you've got the branches. Right. So this is basically, we've walked you through what we had on the slide deck as sort of, you know, here's all the setup, original preparatory stuff. And we can move into um, actually what you would do if you were setting out to do work in this repository. And just to give you an overview, they're kind of like five steps that are involved in a workflow for performing work and we'll go through all of them. The first one is you create a new branch based on the appropriate branch of the upstream repository. Okay. Second step is you would do all your work locally. The third step would be you commit your changes. Fourth step, you would push your changes to your fork, your up, you know, your fork of the repository. And then from that fork, you open a pull request against the upstream repository. Okay. So we can we can walk you through doing all of this. And the the first thing would be creating a branch on which you perform work. Okay. You always want to make sure that you are um, creating a branch from the appropriate branch of the upstream repository. And for for now. If you're here working in the DittoTechCom repository, that appropriate branch is always is going to be the Ditto 2.0 branch. Okay. So if you right click that, and then you can click check out upstream Ditto 2.0. And another window is going to pop up. And here's where it's saying, yes, I'm going to go and check out the Ditto 2.0 branch of the upstream repository. But here, I would say for your local branch name, I would change it from Ditto 2.0. And here's where, you know, you can have your own conventions for what you call your own branches. You know, it could be Maria's branch for Friday, or it could be Maria's test branch for demo, whatever you want to call it. Oh. And it's, okay. you know, you're going to need to not use spaces. Okay. So, you know, you could use hyphen or underscore or camel case. Yeah. And keep the local branch should track or remote branch and go ahead and click OK. And note here now in that left pane in source tree under branches, you can see that Maria's test branch is in bold. Okay. That says that's the branch I'm on. So you've created a new branch here and you're on it. And now you can go ahead and do work. And you know, for, for the purpose of this, we can just say, why don't you open, you know, any one of the data techcom topics and just make a minor change. It doesn't really matter what it is because we don't have to even accept it into, you know, we don't have, even have to accept the pull, pull request, but it'll show you what you're doing. So I'd go ahead and open up your XML editor of choice. Okay. Um. Maria, before you open any files, I just want to <clears throat> make a short interruption here to set a couple of XMetal settings that will be a little bit happier for you in working with the data spec. Okay. All right. 
if you can just go into tools, uh, data options. Obviously, we're going to be working with, uh, okay, so here on this page, um, uh, toward the bottom, it says auto assign element IDs. Turn, uh -huh. that, turn that off. And this may be a, uh, and then uh, for the data version, you probably should make that 1.3. Oh, oh, X Metal 9 didn't have data 1.3. Uh, this might be a problem because uh, there's XML element tags everywhere in the spec. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Didn't think about this. Didn't think about you having X Metal 9. Um, Chris, honestly, I'm almost wondering if the best point to proceed here is to switch over and make me the guinea pig instead of Maria. The alternative, I think, is that I've got to somehow find the 1.3 expansion pack that we made to go with X Metal 9 and have Maria download it and install it, and I think that's probably not worth the effort. Let us switch to having you be the guinea pig. Okay. Well, Maria, I'm sorry about that. I'll help it's you. All right. I'll, <laughs> offline, I'll help you get set up with X Metal, uh, with the X Metal expansion pack, so you will be able to work on Data 1.3 stuff with uh, X Metal okay. 9. Okay, sounds good. Um, thank you for being the guinea pig for a while, and I guess, um, Chris, we're going to have to repeat some of the source tree steps. Um, I've never made a, I haven't made a branch before, but I think I'll, I, I've never done, I've never worked with the TechCom repository, so uh, let's start with setting me up with that. Um, let me no make problem. Myself the, make myself the presenter here. share and I have uh, okay so let me start with oh in fact I'm already here because I found this earlier okay so from here I need to um, from here I need to do a fork right this is the techcom repository fork it and And that's done there and out of source tree. Yeah, I would just go ahead and make sure you copy the URL for your fork because you'll need it okay. in source tree. Okay. I already launched it. Why is it re okay? Um, all right, so this is uh, file clone new, right? Correct. Okay. And that's here and this is going to be um, uh, maggot and, -da, and nope. Let's do tech.com. Okay. Rest all good. Looks good. Okay. And now I want the to. Next thing you so you've yeah you you forked it, you've cloned it. You want to add the upstream repository, and to do that, you click settings. Click add, and that's where you want not your Tom McGlory fork, but the um, the actual URL for the official DotaTechCom. Hmm. So you can go back to your web page. There, you got it. Whoops. Okay. And the go rest. Go ahead is and click OK. Click OK. Oh, I didn't name it upstream. I think I'd rather stick with edit that. Here. Stay conventional here. Okay. Good. Good. So the next thing you want to do is fetch from the upstream. There you go. And if you expand upstream now under remotes, you should see that there are all the branches there. Mm -hmm. And if you want to go ahead and create a 
branch, you would right click on DATA 2.0 and do check out upstream DATA 2.0. And I would change again to, you know, this be the, the appropriate name for the branch. Okay, and you can see you're now on that branch. And you'll see, of course, in the main screen, the, the history of everything from the DITA 2.0 branch of the up, upstream rep repository. So, um, let's go ahead. Why don't you go ahead and open up one of the Ditto Techcom files? In XML. You mean? In your XML editor of your choice. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm just <laughs> going to check those options that I wanted to, to have Maria set. This is, um, yeah, this is, this is just the thing because we don't want X metals. I don't. I, I wouldn't want X metals uh, automatic IDs cluttering up the spec. Um, so I just make sure that setting is turned off, and and uh, we're, we should be good to go. Okay. So I already um, had uh, set my uh, X metal up to be uh, looking at this folder. So so I um, uh, have this data techcom folder, and uh, here's the spec. And what shall I open in here? Anybody, um, why don't you just go into, you know, one of the lang the element reference topics, which would probably be in the LangRef directory. This topic looks perfect. I don't think it needs any editing. Well, why don't you put in a Tom McGlory draft comment just for the purpose of, you know, the sake of this demo. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, and I save the file, and let's go back to source trip. Okay. Aha, something's different. Yeah, well, I I need to figure, I, you're, sorry, it's really hard for me to see your screen, but let me see if I can get this bigger. Hold on, I can, uh, um, just a second. No, no, I've got it fixed on my end. Well, I forgot and, that I'm doing a presentation. Let me just make my screen a little, uh, Make my screen a little bigger, 1280 by 800, and then everything will look better. Why does it keep? Oh, it's here. Oh, here. Okay. All right, there. That should be better for people. And now you can see that there, you know, there's a file. The file you change, concept.data, is showing up as a unstaged file. And the very first thing you see. Chris, you just faded away like you walked away from your microphone. Um, goodness, my cell phone is right next to my head, so I can't really walk away from it. You're back now. Yep, you're good now. <laughs> um, anyhow, you can see that the file you changed is showing up as a unstaged file. Mm -hmm. And the first thing you would do is stage it. Okay. And you can either click stage all or you can select it and then click stage selected. Okay. Either of those will do the job. I just did a right click because I was nosy. Mm -hmm. And then, and does somebody want to jump in and maybe give a little bit more clarity about what's involved in staging versus committing? Mm -hmm. Robert Elliott. Yep. This, this is this is Elliot. Um, so when you stage a file, that means it's ready to be committed, but it hasn't been committed yet. And, and so the basic idea is you've made multiple changes. You know, you made changes to multiple files. You don't necessarily want to commit all those files together. You want to commit those files together, where the changes are related to each other, right? So. 
say you've changed six files and of those you only want to commit three as a single commit. So you would stage those individual files. This gives you the opportunity to make those sorts of choices. Then once things are staged, you will commit all the staged files as a single action. So in essence, commit. So it, so since commit just takes the whatever files you happen to have staged, that's just your way of grouping together the things you want to put together in one commit. That is correct. Exactly. And, they'll, they'll, right. and then that commit will have a single commit message. And if you look at the history of any of those files, they'll all reflect the same, that they're part of the same commit and that they have the same commit message. So if you, I have a question. So if you have, if you have six staged files, but you only want to, but you want to do two commits, you can just select like three and do a commit and select another three and do a commit, or do you have to do them all? Well, yeah. So let's say you had six, let's say you had six changed files and you just hit stage all. And so now you have six staged files and you say, oh, wait a second. I don't want to, I don't want to commit some of these. You would select and selectively unstage the files okay. you didn't want to commit. And just okay. you just go through that process until you've got things organized the way you want for your commits, and then you do your commit. Okay. So you can you can move them back and forth, and you can you can stage and unstage files as long as you want to until you do your commit. Okay. So, so the commit is like when you have a bucket full of stuff that you're handing off to GitHub with a message right. saying, "This is what I'm doing," and right. adding staging. That's just putting things in and out of the bucket that's going to go up. Uh, so another another way to do it, I mean, the, I think the the two main cases I can think of are the ones Elliot described where you've changed six files and you say, okay, I want to make three of these under one commit, and that's that's where you do that. Uh, the other thing you can do is if you know you're working on stuff and uh, you can go ahead and say, I want these six files added, but I know I'm still working on another one that I'm going to come back to later today. And so you you've put things in the bucket. You've said these are added to my commit but I haven't sent it up yet. And then later in the day, you come and finish and put more things in, and that's when you make your commit. Okay. Um, Question, Rob Question, Robert, about that, that use case. Is there an advantage to staging a few files just because you know you're going to want to get back to them later? Is there, re is there a reason not to just bother leaving them unstaged? Um, not, I think the... The reason is if you're also doing things in the model that, that Elliot sort of hinted at, where you might be doing more than one thing at once. Mm -hmm. um, in that case, you want to leave them unstaged, uh, because it's not until you're ready to make your commit that you know, I want these three, but not those three. Um, okay. But if you're just working on one thing, you can go ahead and add them now, or you can add them all later. It, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Something else is, let's say you stage a file and you go off and you do more work. If you modify any file that you've staged, it will automatically be unstaged. Oh, so mm -hmm. that's that. So that's actually some value there. Uh, if you, yeah. if you, because uh, that will sort of catch you if you've made changes that you forgot you made, and you can it'll help you remember uh, that that might help you remember say uh, that you made file changes to this file for a different reason and you didn't want it in that commit anyway. Mm -hmm. That's right. And of course, it, it, so click on that file that you have staged there. Mm -hmm. You can see on the right, it's showing you the differences, right? In this case, like the entire file is different, probably because there was some change to the, the tag right. formatting. But typically, yeah. if you just change like one or two lines, so that, let's say you do that. Let's say you stage a file because you made some changes, and then you don't think about it, you make some more changes. You can use the diff to quickly see, oh, these are the changes that I actually made. And you know, figure out how you want to handle that situation. So let me just. Um, so I, I know what's wrong here. It's that X, X Metal also automatically pretty prints uh, files when you save. So let's say um, I would like to. I'd like to back this change out because I would like to. Because I'd like to come back to this demo at the same point where um, where we can um, where we can uh, see those diffs for that one change that I made, just that draft comment. So what I'd like to do, Chris, if you could walk me through the steps of saying, oh, wait a minute, I've completely screwed up this file. I want to completely throw away the changes I've made to it, get the version from the repository again, and start all over. Can we do that? Sure. All right, let's do. And I'm trying to think of the best way to do that. There's probably um, like yeah, there's probably like four different ways to do it. it yeah, this is this is Elliot. Elliot. The, way, the way I normally do it 
if you right click on on the on the file you have staged mm -hmm. you should see unset as one of your actions i should see which one um let's see um should i unstage it uh yeah tell us yeah the, the window the, the windows ui is a little bit different than the mac ui so um what was the command yeah, you were looking for? I was looking for unset is what it's called on the Mac UI of source mm -hmm. tree. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's a discard. Discard certainly sounds good. Try discard. I have a question. It looked like he could go right from unstaged to commit. Is that really possible? Yeah, so it gives you the option of just uh, of staging and committing in one go. Which you know, if you're if you're confident that the way you've got your changes organized is what you want, that's a convenience. Okay. All right. You can see here that discard. You know, it's saying, do you want to discard your changes to the file? And go ahead and click OK. Yeah, I am. And Mark, we uh, I hope that everybody saw your chat pop up there. Mark just threw in the command line version of what we just did for those who want to see the command line stuff. It'll be in the chat. I'll send out the chat later. Okay, so now I should be able to um, just go back to XMetal and try again, right? But I think I need to close this file without saving, and I need to go into my uh, options, and I need to turn off pretty printing, which is going to be where? Probably not here, not there. Um, and in terms of collaborating with others on this, it's definitely better not to try and pretty print the whole file because it, as you saw, makes it hard to see what actually changed. Yes, please, all X-Metal users, <laughs> make sure you get, get pretty print turned off. I, I know you can do that in other editors too. Um, I'm familiar with working, it's not the default, but it can be turned on. I think you actually have to do it by editing the data config files, which is going to be annoying. Um, I don't think I want to do that. Um, so. Tom, for the sake of this, do you, for the sake of this demo, perhaps you want to just use open up a file in Notepad. Yeah. Oh, that makes me sad. Sure, I'll do that. <laughs> Okay, and then uh, maybe I'll send out a separate note to folks uh, like Maria on the TC who are using XMetal and want to be able to do this. I'll, I, I I know how to do it. It's just more than we should do uh, in this uh, in this demo time frame. So in this demo session. And, and realistically, even in XMetal without doing that, you can still make the edit and make the pull request. It just gets you know it's harder for people to evaluate the change because they can't see line by line what changed. It's unfriendly. So it's the entire process that way. Yeah, yeah, it's unfriendly, right? And it's annoying that uh, unfriendly that or un, un, unfortunate that X, that uh, XML has these uh, problems with white space. But that's our that's the that's the world of XML diff that we live in. Okay, specification, Langref, uh, the content, and we are working with concept. Okay, well then. All right, so here we are again. Here we are again. We've made some changes, and let's go back to source tree and go again. We should see the uncommitted changes, and we can stage it. And then, and that's, if you that's select it, you ought to be able to just see your very small little change. There you go. So much better. Yeah, much better. So, what's next? Um, Okay, I would go ahead and click the commit button up on the top menu bar. Okay, what is that scope to? Do I need to, is, is commit, I guess I, the answer is when I do this, it's going to commit everything that is currently staged, right? So there's no need for it, me to. It's, well, no, it's going to open up a window for you. Okay. So. Okay. All right. So and if here's I had where you put in your commit. You, you've got that one file stage, yeah. and you've got the open box for um, 
you know, and here's where you put in your commit message. Now, if I had multiple staged files here, would I have yet one more chance to select only a few of them uh, to uh, no. to commit? It would it would be all of them. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you again, you can see that you have, you know, you've got two windows open there. There's staged files, unstaged files. You've got the opportunity to unstage all or unstage selected. So you could check and say, hey, you know, I mean, I don't really want to commit all these files. I'm going to unstage a few. Okay. Ready to commit? And, yep. And then uh, uh, just out of curiosity, I'm not going to do it, but uh, is this another shortcut? Uh, if I Yeah, that's a shortcut. Yep. And that'll tell you, you know, exactly where it's going to push the changes to. If you don't select that, you'll have another step in which you actually select. Yeah. Here's definitely. where I want to push to. We'll do we'll do the expanded steps here. Mm -hmm. So commit. Go ahead. Okay. Um, now what should we do here? Is this does that that was just my Windows mm -hmm. login. That's obviously not what I want. What do I want? Um I want normally you would you know, I mean, and we could probably go back to your settings and make sure that you're set up to have this stuff automatically go in. Elliot, you were about to say something? Yeah, this is, I mean, this is a one-time setup thing that you would normally do for Git. Um, but yeah, it should be your full name and whatever email address you want associated with the commits, because that information will be captured as part of the commit metadata. I think that's my GitHub email address, but uh, if you'll bear with me for a second, I just want to check that. And uh, that means you all get to see where I keep my passwords on my laptop. So keep your hands off my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> you really want to show this uh, then? <laughs> in, a, in a recorded demo, Tom? <laughs> no, not really. Uh, it's not even there. It's in my personal folder. I'd say any, any hacker who can't find that in a few seconds. But look, how, look how clever I am. I put it in a folder called Martin instead of a folder called Passwords because they would never look there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so very good. Not embarrassing at all. Here we go. Um, <laughs> okay. So uh, what's happening? Is it doing something? Hmm. Might, might push the commit button again. Yeah, try. You might have to, you know, click OK and then let's try committing this again. Uh, now Doesn't I've look done. like you've actually. Now I've done it twice. This is now a sign of insanity. There, yeah, there, there, I'm guessing there might be an issue with Source Tree not being able to save changes or something. I'm not sure. Hmm. I, th I think for, for a lot of us, there's something that we, we see this first on the command line and then deal with it there. Yeah, let's let's go into your settings and see if we can make some, some changes here. Uh, not under options, but again, I would go back to the settings. For the repo? Yeah. And click advance. And you've got, okay, you've got the user information in there. So that looks like it should, it, you know, that looks correct. Um, hmm, I'm not sure what to suggest here. I go ahead and click OK. So what email address would I use in that? in that place you need to use whatever email address you used for your okay. github user id okay so i'm not sure why your commit is not happening here try selecting push changes immediately too which i normally and then click commit what if i don't do this yeah we can try that Still nothing happens. Hmm. Is there... 
Is okay. there anything so in the we'll... log history tab? Like saying, just in case there, yeah. No. Oh, that's the, that's not a No, I was just trying to see if, whether or not, like if, if it's kind of doing stuff underneath the covers and there's an error being thrown, where do you capture that error? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, we're bogged down here. Maybe it's time that we switch to somebody else and just quickly are able to go through seeing. Um, sure. You know, how a commit oh, happens and then how somebody opens up a pull, pull request. Yeah. Robert or Elliot, either of you who are, well, actually, Robert, you didn't use sorcery, so I think it would default to Elliot. Elliot, would you be prepared to do that? Um. I I think I can do that. Uh, main issue is I'm on a Mac, so the user interface is going to look different in Source Tree. Um, we should all be able to make that uh, to make that cognitive leap. I think. Make, make that leap. All right. Let me just <laughs> what the state of my machine is in here. Um, Take your time. Hide your Martin <laughs> folder. <laughs> um, uh, but you are the presenter, so you can share whenever you're ready. Okay. And Robert, maybe we can put you on call for being the person who will actually look at the pull request once it's opened. Okay. I don't know my. There we go. Uh... And Elliot, this doesn't have to be data for TechCom. It could be the main data repo, whatever. Whatever you are set up with. Okay. Anything that Robert and I have right access to. All right. Um, well, we don't actually have to go through with the merge. We can go everything up to clicking the button. So. Yeah. Okay, you should be seeing my screen here. Let me see if I can find. Oh, yeah. um, Dr. Macro coordinator. Yes, that's my newest activity here. All right. Um, oh, yeah. Well, this is where I've been working. All right. So, um, so this is the this is a, another Oasis repository. Um, I can fork this. URL. Uh, let's see if we want uh, source tree. There we go. All right, so that's been cloned. And there we go. So, so now we've got everything here. So I will, uh, let's see, I guess I need to add a remote. Oh, so that's not what I wanted. Repository and remote. There we go. So if we go back here. It's always surprising quite how different, you know, Mac and Windows versions of a particular application are. I know. And uh, I feel kind of bad for. Windows users because the I think the user interface of the Mac version of Source Tree is, is a bit nicer and there's no reason that the Windows ver, Windows version couldn't be just like it. So sorry, my machine is overloaded here and I think sharing has brought it to it brought it to its knees.
Close a few things that might be sucking down bandwidth here. Geez, Elliot, you, you, you just have a little bit going on there. <laughs> well, I got a lot of RAM on this laptop, but I, I, I yeah, sharing through GoToMeeting seems to, seems to cause problems. Um, I want to see. I don't know if you can see my beach ball of death, but that's hasn't, hasn't come back yet. I'm going to stop sharing for a second and then. The other thing is if, if you know, I, I can, you give me a minute or two, we can switch to my system. All right. If that would help, if All right. Let's see if this resolves itself in a second. Here. Um, I'll take the nuclear option here. Let's try this again. Okay, so now repository and remote. Remote man that is upstream. URL is there. It's all good. That's from upstream. Go. And now I can create a new branch. Uh, where is it? So I've checked out my develop branch, and now I'm going to create a feature branch here. So now I've created a branch in which to make some changes. And I will system is really slow all of a sudden. There it goes. Okay. Clark. We'll open this. I don't want to, I don't want to open oxygen. Is this, uh, I see this is an MD file. Is it uh, lightweight data? I'm just joking. No, it's just, it's just, no, it's not lightweight. Well, I suppose it could be. Um, uh, okay. There we go. So I've made a change. So now we see 
have this uncommitted. Um, I think it's automatically staged for me. If I uncheck it, then it's unstaged. And if I check it, it's staged. This is a, a big difference between the Windows and Mac version mm -hmm. of source tree. It's just the way it indicates uh, staging. Um, and then here I'll say, you know, very important change. I'm going to push this. So this by by push, well, here, I'll do it, I'll do it in two. I think we want to do it in two steps. All right. All right. So I've committed that change to, to my repository. So if we if we look at the history of this branch that I have checked out, which is some small change, uh, we can see there's there's the change I made. All right. So now I want to push this up to origin. So I'll push that up to origin. This is step this is step four of the five steps that Chris outlined earlier for doing some work. Branch work Correct. commit push to fork and then the fifth step will be a pull request. That's right. So let's see if I can get a browser window open here. Okay, so and pull requests you always do not from within source tree or the commit or the command line, but by going to using a web browser and going to your fork. Now I noticed that the push the push goes to uh, your own uh, upstream repository on GitHub, not the not the uh, origin. And then it's then I'm I'm guessing that means that oh, no, the pull so you're going on to so then you're going on to GitHub and doing the pull request from your own from that fork where you just did the push to. Yeah. So just just to to remind you, so the origin is um, is the fork that I made. So the origin repository is this. Sorry. Yeah, I had the terminology backwards. That's right. Yep. Right. Right. And so you can see as soon as I came to this page and refreshed it, it says, look. You just pushed a new branch. Um, do you want to make a, a pull request? And so, and it, it's, it makes this for you automatically. And so, I'll push the push the button here, and I can say, you know, please accept this fix, right? Whatever I want to say to the person who's going to evaluate it. And then the other thing is that you. This is very important. Is you have to you have to choose. Um, the branch that you're going to send it to on the on the repository that you're you're sending the pull request to. So I want this change, I want this pull request to go against the develop branch, not the master branch. So for the spec work that we're doing, you'd want your pull request to go against the did it 2.0 branches, not the master branch. Is that does that usually um come up uh, defaulted to something when you open a pull request or do you or is it going to start off yeah. unselected? So, um, it's the way gonna default to master, works, unfortunately. Okay, so yeah. that's something to watch um, out for. Yeah, in GitHub, you can, as an administrator of your project, you can set the default branch, but typically <laughs> the default branch is the master branch. So, right. but but it's still not fatal if we click uh, create pull request here, even having selected, say, the master branch, because that would just mean that. Robert or Chris, who would be the one accepting the pull request, would say, "No, you did it wrong. Go back and do it again." Right? That, that's right. You can yeah. always throw away the pull request and, and redo it, right? Um, or I think you can even edit okay. the pull request to select a different branch. The main thing yeah. is the branch you select determines what versions of the files um, are going to be compared, right? So, mm -hmm. all right. So I'm going to push the create pull request button here. So that will create the pull request and send it. And you'll notice, and I don't, I'm not sure I like this aspect of how GitHub works, but it automatically switched over to the Oasis open version. That is, it, it automatically took me to the pull request in the context of the, the repository that I sent the pull request to. And let me um, just say, this is only because Elliot has right authority and the authority to accept or reject pull requests on this repository oh is that why okay yes um, I, that's I the only reason did. it does this no okay you're only um, saying this because you've got authority here 
Um, if you don't, you're not going to see this. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, you're talking about uh, the merge pull request button, right, Chris? Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it it will always take you to the repository that you push the pull request to, but you won't necessarily. You only see this if you actually have the ability to accept the merge the merge request. Right. Um, which I happen to do because I scroll down there. I think if you scroll down there, okay. you'll notice that it has all of your commits down below it, or it should. Oh, oh, that was only while you were opening it. Yeah, okay. You'd have to click the tab there for commit. I have to cl click the tab, right. And so, oh, um, yeah, the administrator can merge it, but also when the pull request is open, like if, if one of you open a pull request against the TechCom repository, anybody can go in and comment on it or review it. So, like if I open a pull request against the TechCom repository and any of you, even if you don't have right authority there, any of you can go in and say, wow, why did you make this change? This is a dumb idea. And you can post it there in a comment for everyone to see. Um, so yeah, the, the idea is that it's open. Anybody with their GitHub ID can comment on it or suggest further changes. It's, it's only the administrators that do the final merging. So and we that, are. I made a comment. We are pretty much, I think, at the close of the time we've allocated for this session. Well, we do have 15 more minutes, so, but we can wrap oh, okay. up. We should wrap up, though. Yeah. Do we want to see? Uh, uh, I'm just no. close. Do we need to see the admin do a merge, or or is that? Uh, we we shouldn't do a merge because we don't want to actually put this change in there. Um, true enough. And it's not something that most folks will need to do. No. Um, but the merge is just, yeah, you click on that button and then it says, you sure you want to do this? And we say yes, and it merges. Yeah, sounds uh, I'm gonna say, oh, delete this branch, yeah. Sounds and then, good. yeah, delete branch. Uh, it is worth noting that, uh, that after somebody closes your branch, or rather, after somebody merges your pull request, if you go back in there, you as the person who created the pull request will still see that and it'll, it'll have that little question there, do you want to delete this branch? Because once your changes are in there, uh, the idea is that your your branch was created for this purpose and you don't need it anymore. And so, just as a a cleanup, it gives you a shortcut there to delete your branch. So I'm so that's sort of a would would that be um, like maybe even a sixth step that would be added to Chris's five typical workflow steps after you do your pull request and it gets accepted. You you probably would in most cases be deleting a branch. Yes. Yep. What if you, but what if you, um, so in that case we had where you had, you you made six changes and you, um, or you had six, you had six files there and you only committed, you only staged three and committed three of them. If you deleted that branch, would it get rid of, like what would happen to those unstaged files then? Well, the, the those unstaged files are still on your machine waiting for you to commit them and push them or, or whatever. So the, the work that's happening here in GitHub would have no effect on what's in your local work environment on your machine. Okay. Yeah, if you delete the branch on GitHub and then you go back and say, oh yeah, these three other things, I want to commit them and push them, and you stay in the same branch, <coughs> sorry, I think it's going to end up just recreating in the branch for you. Okay. But the idea with branches generally is that your branch is specific to a set of work and all of that work would be in the pull request. Okay. So if you're working on wildly different things that are going to be integrated separately, you're probably going to have two different branches. Okay. Generally speaking. And it is not as complicated as maybe our demo today has made it look. I don't think I, I think that it uh, it has not, as one of the people who's uh, learning this stuff. I think it has been relatively straight. It seems relatively straightforward to me today. I think that it's I think that it's making sense. And um, and uh, honestly, the only problems we've had at all today have been on my side. So. Well, or me not having having did a one three well, but <laughs> in X metal line. That's 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 kind of my side too. Um, yeah. What is the difference between a fetch and a pull? 
<clears throat> I can try to address that off of the top of my head, and I'm not sure it's going to be right. But I think when you do a fetch, you're getting uh, you get all all the all branches in history, and I'm not sure you get all of that with a poll. Um, but you do. I, I would. So I'm, I'm also on. Me. Well, I'm also on slightly shaky ground because this is just sort of how I've stumbled along and figured it out. But when you do a fetch, you will not change any files locally. Uh, fetch is going to say, "Go up and find out everything that's changed and store that in a database." And pull is actually so if you've got your, I mean, say say you've got a, a branch that you're keeping in sync with the Oasis Dita 2.0, and you're in that branch, and you say, pull the changes from Dita 2.0, it's going to grab all of those and, and merge them in with what you're working on. It's a way to bring everything up to date. It's not, I, I find it very rarely necessary with the way that I handle my workflow, um, because whenever I do something new, I'm, I'm fetching from upstream, finding out what's up there, everything the latest, and then I'm checking out based on that. So I rarely have to do the actual pull to actually make changes locally because uh, they're just there. I'm always working with the latest. Uh, for I, um, I, I have on occasion. For those who are not following the chat window, Mark added uh, uh, everything that Robert just said in about ten words. He said a pull is a fetch <laughs> and a merge. A pull is yeah. a fetch and a merge. A fetch is just a fetch. Okay, thanks. Um, the other question I had was, what happens once a pull request has been approved and merged into the upstream repository? Um, how do, would therefore I have to then do another fetch again at my, yeah. in my local client? Yeah, um, because once that is merged, the upstream repository has changes. Uh, once any pull request is merged, once any change is made there, there have been changes in that upstream repository, and so doing a fetch will make your clients aware of them. Uh, okay. So if I say, check out a new branch based on the latest 2.0, and then three pull requests are merged, uh, I'm going to be three commits probably out of date with my knowledge. So I want to make sure and fetch again even if some of those were mine, I need to fetch again and, and find out about them. Well, when you do a fetch, does it update both the a repository on your local machine and the origin repository? No. No. So, so for example, if you pull new changes from upstream that somebody else made, you then need to manually push those changes to your origin in order to sync your origin up with the, the current state of the of upstream. Is that something that one typically wants to, to do on a regular basis, uh, keeping one's origin repository updated? Well, you have to yes, do a pull request, right? Uh, not Pretty exactly. Much. I, there... I don't like to. This, this is where you get into different ways of working with Git. I don't like to do that. Um, because I always, you know, I, I fetch from upstream all the time, but whenever I create a new branch, I'm working off of the latest. And by default, when I push that new branch up to my repository, to origin, I'm pushing something that's the latest. And it doesn't matter whether any other branches up there are getting out of date, you know, I can go back and fix them later if I need to. Well, that's, that's a good you know, point. So the reason this is really a personal preference type thing. I think they're, you know, they're, they're the reason some people might want to do it. It's not necessary. It can be very time consuming to, you know, always ensure that your your forked repository is synced and level with the upstream repository. And it isn't necessary from you know if, if what you want to do is be able to contribute as long as when you create your branch you're fetching and creating your you know your branch based on the latest good content on upstream 
you're good. I want to throw one more thing out there for confirmation that I think I understand now, and that is the reason that um, Robert's workflow works and is harmless is because um, it's because of the fact that you're always working on branches, and so every branch, every every sort of set of work that you're doing is always going to be on a on a new branch, and these branches are. Are, are what's going, getting pushed up to your origin repository, and then um, and then they uh, and then that's so because of the fact that they're on different branches in the origin repository, it doesn't matter if other stuff in the origin repository is out of date because this stuff is this this stuff in the new branch came from the latest code. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So I've still I've still got from our demo a couple of weeks ago. I've still got a couple of branches out in my repository called oops and whatever else I did during that live demo. And that's just because I haven't bothered to clean them up yet. But those can stay there for the next three years and they will always be out of date. They're always going to be a point in time branch from what existed two weeks ago. But that's not going to interfere in any way with any other work I'm doing because the other work I'm doing every time I'm going to start with the latest. So they can go stale and disappear finally when I choose to delete them. What would be a what would be a bad thing, and I don't even know if you can do this, but I'm but I'm thinking that what would be what might be a bad thing would be if sometime three years from now you'd you remember that we made a change on that oops day that we really liked but we never bothered to uh, do a pull request for, and so you might like to do a pull request for it now and so you might do that but because your oops branch is now three years out of date maybe the source files that you need to merge with are way out of date on the master repository now and so it would be extra work because of that for the administrator to do that merge but that's that's essentially the only damage that, that could result right yeah so it's it's probably not going to be extra work on the administrator because the administrator will get that and it will say Merging is blocked because there's a conflict, and the administrator would go back to me, because it's my OOPS branch, and say, you need to bring this up to date and resubmit. Mm. Uh, that's, that's happened over in the Did Open Toolkit a few times where somebody submits something that they've been working on for a few months, and half the files in it are out of date. And we as the evaluators there aren't going to say, uh, you know, clean it all up for you. That's, that's on the person trying to submit the change. <clears throat> okay. But yes, that's where the extra work will come in. And that's where if, if I've got a branch that has grown stale because it's out of date and other people have made changes to the same files, I'm going to have to figure out how to merge that. Uh, and that's, that's going to mean you know, trying to bring my branch up to date resolving any merge conflicts, which is a bit of a pain, but I think source tree makes it easier than my command line operation, and then uh, resubmitting or pushing your changes up. I mean, there's other ways to deal with that issue as well. I mean, yeah. one of which is just clone a copy of that branch in a new, new directory, and then just use simple file comparison to figure out the changes you made yep. and sort of do the merge sort of in advance against the latest stuff. And that's, that's how I've typically handled it, um, because my changes where I've run into that have not been huge. So I, I it basically end up doing it over, but by doing a diff to copy over the changes I want to the latest code. Guys, I've got a bit. Oh. I want to thank everybody. And, um... Yeah, this has all been extremely useful. Yeah, thank I agree. Much. I agree yeah, too. Thank you very, very much. Thanks to all of the experts. The and um, and uh, I think I'll end the recording now and uh, I'll let you all know, everyone know on the TC list when it's available or uh, or possibly possibly just by email. But anyway, thanks everybody and bye. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Bye-bye. Thanks all. Bye.